how to accelerate time to production by 97%, what to consider security-wise when picking up a mobile technology, and what the hell is the service mesh? This and many more in the Architecture Weekly number 48. Hello everyone, my name is Vladimir and uh, Merry Christmas to whom it may concern. First highlight of this week is the LinkedIn's journey of optimizing their delivery time by 97%. And how did they do that? So their story starts many years ago with like small monorepo, but later with a growing size, they had to split it into 17 repositories just for a single bit of the, their product. Later, those repositories grew in size as well, and with all those dependencies, you know, tests and all that stuff, they had uh, uh, very long delivery times. So they decided to improve it even more. They went back to the monorepo per product, called for Yarn workspaces and managed to do a great job decreasing the delivery time from days to just a couple of hours, so it's like 97%, right? So here you can see a, a very long detailed post on how they did it and what strategies helped them out and how they manage their branches and all that stuff. Check out their article. Nowadays, many businesses are mobile first, like now banks or those AI filtering apps. And when you start a new mobile application, you need to know your security requirements and consider this technology against those requirements, right? To address them the best possible way. So with the help of my friends from Litzel and my friend security specialist Vixentile from Cossack Labs, I wrote a very detailed security guide on the security implications of uh, mobile technologies. I described the threats for mobile world and provided a table which compares those mobile technologies against those known threats. Give it a very detailed read. And the last highlight for today is Istio and Service Mesh explained in 15 minutes. What the hell is the Service Mesh? So remember we split our monoliths into microservices and now we need to make them communicate with each other in a secure fashion, expose their API endpoints, uh, monitor them and many, many more. So one option we have is to duplicate the code that is doing that. The other one is attaching a sidecar for every service and handle all this stuff there. This concept is called Service Mesh and Nina does a great job explaining it all in just 15 minutes. Watch out for the video. I'm starting the follow-up session with an article about house engineering. I already included several articles about that, but you know, repetition makes perfect. And in this one, you will find out the story, how the house engineering can help figuring out very obscure issues in the multi-service setup. Find a lot of the details in this article about how house testing helps building more resilient applications. Another one is the article about the evolution of the state transfer. Many, many years ago, we started with just submitting forms through post requests. Then Ajax came up, then GraphQL appeared for different purposes, so the evolution were quite long. Now in the world where each user has several devices and where several users want to collaborate on a single document in the web, we need new approaches. And this one is called local first approach, when you just do your edit things on your local state and then this state is synchronized in background. Find out the article that will explain it to you better. Next one is the Kubernetes for data science practice. And as far as I understood from the article, uh, the big problem for data science and machine learning is that like, you know, uh, those people are perfectly capable of solving the, the task on their local machines, but having have some issues scaling it all in a production environment. So Kubernetes can help with that. And there's a tool, open-sourced one called Kubeflow, which helps do that at scale. So this is a short note that will describe the approaches and how Kubeflow can help solve this problem. Next one is about the transactions in the distributed systems. So this article in particular, tells us about two approaches, how we can have distributed transaction. The well, first one is a true transaction, right? So if we need to make a commit with several databases, 
Then we use something like two-phase commit, where we prepare first one, prepare the second database, make sure that both transactions will be committed and then actually commit them, thus the two-phase. Another approach is the distributed segas, when we don't have, you know, a distributed transaction, but instead we have something that is called long leave transaction. So it's not a transaction in, you know, a formal meaning, but it actually means that we have a set of short leaving transactions, which happens like during like milliseconds in each of the service. And then we coordinate the state. And if something goes wrong, we're all back all of it. So this article compares those two approaches and highlights the pros and cons of both once follow the article. And now it's time to talk about the documentation. I love personally the architecture decision records. So they help to build up, you know, the history of uh, architecture decisions in the project. And uh, there's a format for that architecture decision record. And, uh, and last week, the markdown template for architecture decision records got bumped to version number three. So in this article, it will explain what changed, how to structure the architecture decision record and, you know, make it more useful for you. And if we speak of the ADRs, we definitely need to talk about this article in particular. So this one includes the best practices of writing concise, clear and useful decision records. And you know that those records are very important to your project, so follow the best practices mentioned in this article to make them really useful. Okay, the last one for today. In the end of the year or beginning of the next one, many companies uh, make the performance review rounds or just 360 rounds. And in this time, you need to provide the feedback to your coworkers. What I observed is that a lot of people just don't know how to do that properly, how to provide useful, actionable feedback. I wanted to help this issue, so I recorded a video that you can find here and there about how to do that really well. So how to make it, the feedback professional, actionable and useful to your coworkers. Watch the 10 minutes video by myself and of course, leave the feedback. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much. If you like the content, please make sure to subscribe, leave a like, or if you have any feedback to this particular video or to the channel in particular, leave a comment down below. This helps, you know, building up the YouTube channel and bring useful content to more users. Thank you very much. See you next week.